thank you someone for introducing me hello guys i'm sindhuja rao and welcome to the first session of the day on trust me i'm an insider deep dive into zero trust security so um, i have a big lineup of uh, agenda here so we'll start off with how does the current security practice look like the what why and how of zero trust what goes into it and i'll wrap up the session with some action item for you guys and i want this session to be as interactive as possible so do post your questions at any point in the chat and i'll go over them at the end of the session or if i just get tired of talking i also have a small quiz at the end so uh, yeah do stick around now um, this might be a controversial slide to begin with but i want you to take a moment and think about when was the last time you thought of any of these things uh when was the last time you changed your credentials without a warning from your company or thought about what encryption actually goes into your application uh if you have a gotten promoted or changed your teams recently had you thought of revoking your previous accesses or resources now it doesn't mean that anyone is a bad employee for any of the, or doing any of these things but it is one of the many glitches that we have in our systems we just don't do user behavior analysis within the organization properly uh the reason i say that is because about 34% of data leakage cases come from inside of an organization and out of which 90% attacks come from phishing emails which trigger ransomware attack very often and yes drive by downloads are very real employees do click on friendly links that can break their system in one go uh so if someone's new to this ransomware is when an attacker takes hostage of your data encrypts it and then shares the decrypting key for those files only for an exchange of a hefty ransom uh typically in bitcoins and unfortunately we have been seeing more and more of these attacks recently say the supply chain attack on solar winds or the recent kazea attacks we ha which have uh, affected more than 1000 businesses so um, some facts about the kazea attack uh kazea is a company that provides something called managed services or msps and many businesses that are part of the uh, supply chain attacks are mostly msps as well uh they provide virtual system or server administration to monitor and manage infrastructure of businesses like supermarkets banks etc we honestly still don't know the full impact that the are evil or rebel group has done yet but uh what they did was they found a zero day vulnerability in one of the on premise bsa servers so interestingly they used something called side loading where they uh, where the actual dll of the malware was executed by attacking the payload of a legit windows anti malware uh, executable file which is i guess it was built in 2014 and most uh, probably they took the advantage of which also shapes an important discuss discussion on patches but we also now uh, attacks on businesses are very common but we also saw something very more uh, much more severe happen during the pandemic about 92 ransomware attacks happened almost every day on healthcare sector this affected 600 different healthcare organizations uh, about 18 million patient records were leaked and this resulted in losses of about 21 billion dollars but why this sector for starters healthcare industry is known to run one of the oldest systems when it comes to data processing so running decade old software uh, using iot devices that have maybe never been scanned and most importantly the human factors uh, everyone was so busy in hospitals that it served as a perfect distraction for the attacks and that's what the attackers are looking to take advantage of and due to the need of the r they knew that hospitals being so critical needed the services back asap so they knew that they would pay the ransom and it's astonishing to see how ransomware has evolved to a point where it's no longer uh, done as a sidekick thing they run a legitimate business now they're hiring professional negotiators saying hey if you can't pay a million dollars how about we settle for a half a million or something so they're not messing around with their business and this has evolved to something called a blackmail wear model and with this blackmail model they don't want to hurt their media reputation so if you ask me most likely they're going to give your data back but that doesn't mean that they don't already have a copy of your data ready to be sold in the black market or on the dark web 
So just to paint a pretty picture, imagine you in a power plant which is fully automated, and one day the whole grid goes down uh, on lockdown, and uh, you are inside, and there's no way of getting out. Why? Maybe the IoT, maybe the software, the people, your ignorance, or uh, might as well be the Illuminati, if you ask me. So now I don't know about you, but that's a Mr. Robot episode I don't want to be part of. So one question is always up for debate in these uh, news. So should you pay the ransom money or not? And that's a very important question. I want you to ask yourselves and answer it at the end of the session. So what I'm getting as it at is, despite companies spending so much resources on security, these data breach news are always out there, right? And it's very costly. Companies need to pay a lot of money not only to save their businesses but in litigations, government disclosures, and honestly, getting the trust back of their customers is morally way costlier. Also, the way we're working has changed. You're now able to log in uh, to work from your iPads and phones, but the current security scenario cannot keep up with the variety of devices and the data usage, which seems to be nowhere decreasing. So the same rule checks that you run for your workstation, they won't work for your personal devices, but what would work will be the exploit. So we need something more robust here. And finally, it is important to understand that just because one connects to a secure organization, uh, the endpoint, which is you, the user, or the device, doesn't become secure itself. It is still vulnerable as much as it was before and actually possesses threat not only to itself, but to the lateral movement of traffic inside the organization and can spread far more quickly than you can save it. So protecting customer data is no longer the only requirement. Uh, the organization's data is equally vulnerable. Hence, what Zero Trust basically talks about is building trust with resources and devices equally inside and outside your network. Uh, how? By not trusting either of them. So what does Zero Trust bring to the table? Uh, the current approach based is more on static and network-based perimeters like uh, network location or the IP addresses. Uh, what's new is now we focus more on the users, assets, resources instead of the network itself, which kind of makes sense because the originator of traffic and the exploits in most of the cases are among these. Also, if you have ever dealt with a deny implicit deny rule uh, with an access control list, that's an approach. Just because your username is admin, you shouldn't be given full privileges. And privilege escalation attacks are often exploited this way. Rules should be built around denying access by default rather than allowing them even with some level of access. Also, the linear approach revolves around threat by nature, how to recover from it and then decide how to mitigate it. However, the approach should be from ground level to limit those chances rather than taking them. But of course, it doesn't mean that threat hunting is any less fun in zero trust. Uh, it actually plays a pivotal role and rather takes threat hunting more rigorously and can be modeled to act in real time using orchestration, studying IO, I, IOCs, or etc. So a uh, small history lesson. Zero Trust began as a discussion in 2004 in the Jericho Forum, which was held by a lot of CISOs and some vendors. After a lot of discussion on uh, the concept of killing the perimeter, we saw Google being the public face for zero trust after the years of research and development and introduced beyond corp in around 2014. But this was mostly built for developers and cloud infrastructure. So it was not a big hit in the marketplace. So Forrester then changed their original design a bit in about 2017 and said, hey, data is the center of the universe. So we should focus on how to manage it, classify it, categorize it, and most importantly, protect it. And meanwhile, Carter then created their own model called CARTA, uh, Continuous Adaptive Risk and Trust Assessment, which focused more on how to tackle risks inside and outside of a network. And more or less, this also kind of shaped how the uh, zero trust architecture looks today as an industrial standard. So we can think of it in a cyclic structure, giving the endpoints a hard time verifying themselves. When they do, don't take them for granted. And don't forget about them because they're always suspicious. Now, one question might arise uh, that why are we talking about zero trust security now, even when it was coined back in you know, 20, uh, 2004, right? The problem was uh, 
even though knowing the advantages of zero trust, it was not easy to implement as the network changed a lot through the years. We went from on-site data centers to cloud perimeters and also because of the cost it came along with it. But now we are at a point where we accept the fact that just like the IT perimeter, our networks are also changing. So that doesn't mean we run the same old, uh, same decade old security structure, right? And uh, we are also able to implement complex scenarios and network designs easily uh, thanks to the available resources in technology as well as the brilliant engineers, architects, architects and network admins that we have today. So the type of networks, devices, control systems, IoT, software, or whatever you say, it is all demanding zero trust as an extension. And uh, when we talk about the zero trust extended uh, or ZTX framework, there, there are about seven pillars to it that Forrester in their audits also determine in the industry to decide who is doing a better job at implementing these uh, zero trust principles to, uh, you know, for their customers. Uh, the pillars are network, data, people, uh, workload, devices, visibility and analytics, and automation and orchestration. So when you want to implement the ZTX framework, answering the following questions gives you an idea about how to implement it. For example, what are the firewall rules you will be using? How are you controlling your data? How are you encrypting it? Uh, how are you... Uh, how are the people in organization understanding security? How are you identifying devices, which is one of the main concerns, and IAM comes into picture there, well, which I'll discuss later. And based on these answers, we have some of leaders and strong performers uh, in these fields, which also obviously keep on changing uh, per quarter. So um, if we look at the architecture, this is kind of the ideal model for Zero Trust developed by National Institute of Standards and Technology. In this, the policy decision point is kind of the CPU of the computer. And it consists of the policy engine, which is responsible for the ultimate decision to later to grant, deny, or revoke access uh, to the resource. The policy administrator is like the middleman between the uh, control plane and the data plane. So it will command whatever action it receives from the policy engine to the policy enforcement point. And this is a part of the data plane which sits behind the requester uh, and the resource. So this PEP would be what the requester is going to interact at all points. So it can be your firewall, maybe even a login page for that matter. So for this PDP to work, the architect or admin should feed some external con constraints and rules. Uh, so they can be like, should the device be at a per particular industrial standard? Uh, how to validate a certificate in network, what should be your CA, or maybe what user belongs to which group, how does the Active Directory tree search happen as input into a trust algorithm, which also I'll discuss. Uh, sorry. Now, a uh, lot of companies nowadays prefer building their own models and architectures. So you might find an additional trust engine or PE and PA to be in the same unit, you know, stuff like that. But they're mostly based off on this model. And one of the variations of zero trust is micro segmentation. Uh, as the name suggests, it segments your network into uh, to install multiple PEPs for your smaller perimeters, basically break down the network into small segments. And this also kind of shapes the cybersecurity mesh. Uh, this is like your uh, Charizard of our Charmander. Okay. So cybersecurity mesh or C mesh as I call it, so only I call it, so is the extension of the ZTX framework where we give a lot of importance to the deparameterization part. This mesh shifts the focus from implementing PEPs at the perimeter to a custom made identity based verification approach, still keeping the orchestration centrally so that any threat remediation can happen simultaneously on all nodes which helps us to minimize the lateral movement of any attack vectors. So now your IT team can create smaller perimeters, well, if you still want to call that. And this distributed architecture can have its own set of rules, own, own PEPs, PDPs, etc. They don't have to interact with each other. They can vary depending on ZTS pillars we talked about uh, at each level. So for example, one layer can be for bring your own devices uh, uh, 
type of network connecting to the corporate, which would have its own set of rules. Another layer can be for remote access users. And each of these layers can further have separate application layer security rules, creating kind of the mesh, which gives its name. And this gives less scope for cyber criminals and hackers to exploit an entire network, again, meaning less lateral movement that we're aiming for. So uh, one thing here, the ZTX and CS mesh, in my opinion, can be interchanged because they're basically fancier names for the root zero trust principles that we already know. So I'll be using them interchangeably. So uh, please don't sue me. So now the goal for these approaches uh, when we are talking about network requirements is always the same. Protect the resources and requesters from harming each other. To make that decision on PP and implement the cybersecurity mesh, one should know majorly what type of assets are in the deployments. Uh, because rule for company assets will differ from the rules for personal devices or an IoT device that belongs to the network infrastructure, uh, which is issued to the organization itself, right? And the packet flow visibility is very important as it defines how we can continuously maintain that trust that we've been talking about. So IPS inspection on the PEP and over the network is something one should consider. Also, never let the requester interact with the resource directly. It's like inviting Satan for dinner. It's not going to go well. Lastly, enterprise assets may not be reachable to certain PEPs based on asset parameters. For, for example, uh, mobile assets might get a different login page uh, than remote users or the on-premise users. So depending on user experience, you can also make those changes. Now, there are other, uh, many other approaches and network requirements to consider, which will be, you know, which will change based on type of network devices available, importance of the resources, uh, number of requesters, and how scalable is your deployment and the cost that can be allocated for them. Now, um, since the pandemic started, most of us are working from home remotely. So this scenario is kind of what makes sense to me to discuss with you. Uh, so what do we need? We need a head end that's smart where the users can terminate their sessions. It can be a firewall, router, and, uh, uh, and I cannot stress enough on the importance of encrypting, maintaining the integrity and authenticity of the traffic that goes across this deployment. Then choose a happy PEP or policy enforcement point. This will help with authenticating the users. Again, just username passwords will not work. Your beloved admin123 passwords can be cracked in less than a second. So we need more than that, definitely. Authentication by itself is not enough. So we also need the policy engines and PDPs in, in place. And uh, we need dynamic policy, as you might have observed in the architecture. Static rules are no good in zero trust. Often missed, but, but very, very important when you want to go back and find out what was done is logging the sessions. So this can be syslog servers, your monitoring tools, et cetera, et cetera. And major pillar of zero trust to continue monitor the traffic in the network is a cherry on the cake if you can have the threat defense tools integrated at all possible uh, points of interception of potential attacks. Now, one thing to notice is why I didn't put this in a linear list of this, these ingredients is because that's the beauty of ZT, uh, uh, you know, zero trust extended. You don't have to start at a single point. You can first choose your IAM server, for example, make rules there, and then integrate the other sections of the framework. Similarly, you can begin with your threat orchestration tool or logging method and then move on to your head-end deployment. And this stands true for remote access uh, user or on-premise user application anywhere. Now, I can't dis uh, discuss the whole end-to-end -end implementation. Otherwise, we'll be sitting here till the TDI ends. So I'll uh, try to cover with a simple example. So starting off with next generation firewalls, understanding them. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with the existing firewalls with respect to security. But uh, for zero trust, a next generation firewall is a better fit because of its more flexible approach towards security. By that, I mean it has a better perception of ciphers, inclusion and remediation of old ciphers, things like that. So you can create multiple sub instances from a single instance and 
also hosted over cloud services in a lightweight fashion. We also have more granularity over the net tra uh, traffic or network, which uh, so the intrusion prevention system that we use is what defines a line between a normal firewall and a next generation firewall. You can also integrate the uh, next generation firewall with multiple services for incident response and threat detection. And also it's easier to integrate them using network automation tools such as APIs uh, and uh, APIs and other tools. Now, IAM is a very big part of the discussion as it helps us to create identity-based rules that I've been mentioning. So this is your policy engine, your brain, or your trust engine, the PDP, whatever you want to call it. So from verification, trusting, discarding, and then upholding privilege access management, this guy does it all. Now, many firewalls can do a lot of these things, but in my opinion, leveraging these duties to an expert like I am reduces a large overhead on the firewalls as they have their own set of operations to worry about. So uh, that's a better approach. So I am functions with three main branches. So authentication is who is connecting? How did we verify the endpoints? And now with zero trust, authentication is the first contact with the attack surface. So your single factor authentication of EAP is not going to work here. And so we have evolved gladly to multi-factor authentication. Many of us might be using it already, maybe when connecting to your school or work workplace. For example, Duo Push, RSA code, certificate with EAP and smart cards with credentials, et cetera. Authorization is OK. Uh, user was able to connect, but what access should they get? Do they belong to the IT team? If yes, what necessary minimum workloads should be assigned to them? So basically everything about privilege access. And accounting is how much data is the user consuming? When did they log in? Uh, are the session cookies active without their work? All these go into data billings for that user so that it can be tracked if required on the IAM server. Therefore, a lot of times your IAM server is also referred to as your AAA server. So I've been chanting this word trust for about, I guess, 99 times till now, right? But understanding trust is, trust is one thing and measuring it is totally different. We need to drop down to the server level to conclude the endpoint should be trusted or not. This is done broadly in five categories. Uh, the supplicant, which is essentially the endpoint which sends the EAP request to a middleman like a WLC, firewall, or switch, it forwards the access request, which, are, which is a radius packet in most of the cases, to the IAM server or your policy engine. Subjects, data, and database are your Active Directory, Active Directory LAP server, uh, wherever your user database exists, and the contextual information history that gets shared with the IAM server. Asset database is essentially the same thing, but for the endpoints. Policy requirements are the rules that get created, the minimum requirements before granting or denying access to an endpoint, or the user through something called profiling and posturing. And lastly, threat intelligence and logs are everything in a circular manner. How you act on your trust conclusion depending on the threat info available. Do you still trust the user on endpoint? If not, what action will you take? And the same rules you create on the policy engine. So all these things constitute basically a permit or a deny rule to the requester. Now, to quantify the trust, we leverage something called profiling and probing. Uh, let's take an example. Say I create a brownie point system to find out if a workstation that's connecting to my network is a Windows 10 machine or not. So uh, yeah, no, not that kind of brownie. <laughs> So I'll give it 10 points if the endpoint is from Microsoft. Uh, let's say that happens, but I still can't grant it access because the score is too low. So I profile it for more information. Uh, if I get to know that it's a Microsoft product and it's a Windows system, I, ha I hand out further points. And on further inquiry, I get that it, this is a Microsoft machine and also a Windows 10. So I reward it with the highest brownie points. So we started out with not knowing anything about a device that's coming in. So And we concluded it with that this is a Windows 10 machine. And with that, I changed the profile of this guy from an unknown profile to a Windows 10 profile. And there's actually a scoring database that is built 
on the IM servers, which are way more rigorous than my example and way less generous than Opera. So in the background, if you want to know what's happening, there's a radius packet that contains several attributes, like the framed IP address, OUI, and other attributes. Uh, the OEI, for most of its part, has vendor specifications, which might include MSFT. And the Dora packet in the DHCP would have a class identifier field that has MSFT enabled in it, which proves that it's an MSFT device. And meanwhile, this is happening. The endpoint prompt gets prompted with something called a guest portal. When the user generates a HTTP or HTTPS probe to this portal, the field of IP user agent field contains the Windows NT 10.0 information. And all these steps tell us what we wanted to know about the endpoint. So the goal at the end of this communication is uh, the IAM server should learn these details so that the admin can create the rules, the authorization profiles and policies, etc., in order to know how to categorize the devices. As we saw, this is one of the pillars for the ZTX framework. And once this profile is done, uh, a COA gets kicked off. So uh, let's say you took a window, you took the same Windows 10 machine at an airport to serve some Netflix while you were waiting for your flight. The first least access given to this machine would be to the guest portal. Now, this portal would be where you may enter your name, phone number, other information, so that the internet access to browse Netflix is via the IAM server. Now, every time we do a profile or a posture check, we make a result which is either the endpoint is a compliant one or a non-compliant one. Uh, there's also a third state for posture called unknown, but let's just stick to these two right now. So when that guest portal is accessed for Netflix, the IAM server pushes a dynamic access list or DAPL on the machine to give it internet access and no corporate access. And uh, you can then fine tune this DACL as per your perimeters. For example, for a remote user case, it would be different. For a guest user, it will be different and so on. With that, a COA gets generated, which is change of authorization. So for our remote access user case, if you decide to connect to VPN for an internal corporate site or for some work after your movie, a COA will kick off again and the NAD device, network access device or Authenticator, in our case, which is the firewall, is prompted to re-authenticate you and change the profile associated with this endpoint. So if you decide that you're going to download a pirated game after your work, should your trust profile still remain the same? Uh, I'm mean, No, right? So since that beats the whole purpose of ZTX principle of the continuous evaluation, uh, so if you're browsing malicious site or malvertising, the COI sent can trigger terminate session flag or disable host port flag so that it cannot affect any peer devices, especially when you're on a shared network such as airport. So um, what's posture? In its most basic form, it's a condition check. Uh, the, the rules that I've been mentioning that your IAM uh, admins should decide to make. So if you are one, you can create those small perimeter rules by checking, for example, uh, there should be a particular antivirus installed, the Windows 10, which is connecting, should be of uh, the latest patch. Say there should not be a USB in use of this on the system's hardware, maybe because it's trying to introduce a rogue device into the network, which you don't want. So rules like that. Uh, you can also create compound checks with multiple rules as well. And each result against creates a COA. And based on this, you can grant or deny or quarantine the entry of uh, a resource. Again, with uh, zero trust and CS mesh, the posture helps in creating a custom rule for each perimeter. If you are at application layer, your posture rules are going to be different. If you are on a remote location, your posture rules would be focusing on something else and they can coexist in harmony. So uh, in the background again, on the left, we can see we can have users coming in via different methods like VPN, WebAuth, Wired Wireless, and their access request is sent to the IAM server, and their authentication and authorization is done based on the rules created. This can be done using SAML for cloud perimeters or AD, LDAP, certificate authorities, and simultaneously for multi-factor authentication, uh, multi-vendor support is always a good thing on your server. 
And some of the standard recommended protocols that we'll use to pass on this information would be 802.1x, MAP, WebAuth, MSChap v2, etc. Now, we had the IAM part done. This is the end of it. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure you'd be lying if you said a year back your work from home started smoothly, especially when you're a migrated user like me from my desk at office to my broken table at home. But VPN did save us there. And not only we have been using VPN for schools, for work, it also has helped us to keep us entertained as well, which uh, honestly, I don't want to get in trouble for. So, But interestingly, during my research for this talk, I found articles and opinions about how Zero Trust is the next generation VPN and it replaces it. Uh, I would assume that it might be the thoughts due to some of the myths around it. And uh, fun fact, I, I work with VPN every day, so I got to defend it. So Zero Trust doesn't talk about CIA principles by nature. It does have values of it, of course, but we do need some tool to implement the same. So assuming that you're always on a public network is a good way to incorporate encryption in your business. And no, VPN does not only work from outside. It doesn't segregate your traffic based on perimeter. For example, if you're a federal body, your inside data is as vulnerable and as important as your outside data. So you can leverage VPN for your uh, for your network in that manner. Also, at this point, I would blame your network architect if they, told, they, they tell you that VPN users get full access by default. This is one of the biggest myths. VPN does not talk about full access. It totally depends on the rules you're implementing on your head end and your IAM server to assign privileges to your remote users, just like you will do it for non-remote users. Lastly, VPN has grown, th grown through the years as well. We have uh, incorporated so much of the multi-vendor support and all of the VPN uh, applications that are out there, they do have uh, one of the latest technologies as well as the latest features to help you have just a better experience of VPN. So what I suggest my customers generally is, if you have VPN, embrace it and build zero trust upon it. Now, the part where trust centric meets threat centric. Some of the key things uh, is uh, so, so uh, some of the key things that the threat detection and incident response focuses on are the continuous evaluation of the trust in zero trust. So in the security world, it's always good to be suspicious. Uh, so this can be done in many ways. You can integrate your threat detection tools with your IAM server or with your PEPs like firewalls, have cloud-based central administrator, uh, administrator services on these. It can be from your organization or leveraged as a service from a different vendor. I mean, whatever works for your network. One interesting thing about evolution of threat hunting has been the orchestration part. Uh, imagine a flowchart with rules created for many possibilities. Say, what happens when a malware is detected? What action should your user take? How would your IAM server react to it? Uh, yada, yada. Now, your orchestrator will uh, not manually implement these actions directly, of course. So there is the automation part and using services like APIs and security service exchange to implement these tasks are always handy. And many of the vendors in accordance with the extended uh, detection and response are already doing that. So um, logging things just makes life easier for anyone who wants to work with threat hunting. What happened? When happened? To whom did it happen? How long was the outage? All these questions are very real and most of the times they get unanswered. So even if you get a downtime in your business, you might have noticed that the first thing your support team asks are the logs. And if you don't have them, it becomes extremely difficult to pinpoint the culprit. So in my opinion, uh, good logging techniques are underappreciated. So some of them could be like, it's always better to send logs to a remote monitoring tool instead of using local logging. You should always recheck your logging levels to make sure that you have enough information to go back and check what happened. Syncing NTP servers in logging servers, if you uh, if you have several of them, is always a good practice. When you're insta installing application on your customer end as well, I would suggest to share debugging tools with them so that you always have some accountability. Now, I have taken the example of remote access scenario, right? So. 
uh, let's take uh, an example. Uh, we have uh, an, a system which has AnyConnect installed in it. Now, AnyConnect is Cisco's uh, VPN application. Now, this is this holds true for any vendors. So I'm not being biased here. So what happens is, let's assume AnyConnect is installed on that machine. It also has secure endpoints for posturing and threat detection and uh, other things. And say the user also has the MFA application installed on their phones. Now, um, let's assume everything uh, went fine, right? The workstation was able to connect to VPN. Your PEP firewall was already integrated with the IAM server, which in return was integrated with the MFA server. And also your orchestration tool, which is SecureX in my example, is also integrated with your firewall. But what if there was some malicious traffic on the machine after some point? So what happens is, uh, since you're monitoring your uh, traffic through your firewall and orchestration, an IPS alert gets generated to the firewall, which in return triggers an SSE event to your uh, orchestrator. And that in return triggers a workflow. Now in this scenario, the first thing that you should think about is terminating the VPN. The reason being, you don't want any more malicious traffic to come inside your network, to the peers, wherever. So the one, the first step should be to send a COA to your IAM server to terminate that VPN. And after that, what you can say that to the MFA server, you can trigger uh, uh, an SSE to say that block this user. We don't want this user connecting again. And also alert a user just as a user experience that they won't be able to connect anymore. So once we have terminated all sort of sessions and we have enough information, what we can do is we can start an isolation of the endpoint, meaning that we can create IOCs so that we can do uh, threat analysis, which is a very important part to know uh, in future if such kind of attacks happen, uh, what are we going to do? Now, uh, one of the many interesting things that happened in the recent elections was that under the new presidency, there has been an executive order shared in public with shared with public to encourage zero trust architecture to be implemented. Uh, the key points talk about federal bodies uh, that, uh, themselves would be migrating to adapt uh, ZTX principles in the best interest of data security. Uh, we are more likely to see security as a service to be available for businesses, including government holdings. And company with data breaches will no longer be allowed to keep the records to themselves. And this is a huge issue before because the books get tossed quickly to avoid or rather deny data breach news. And we see that very often companies denying claims uh, that their data was leaked, uh, you know, so to avoid public code. The white paper should be in the chat for anyone who wants to go through the whole thing. Otherwise, I'll put it at the end. So, uh, now, based on cybersecurity mesh implementation and everything we have discussed so far, Gartner has predicted how security is going to look in the next four to five years. Now, we, we only can assume that uh, these would be the case, but since most importance, uh, you know, more importance is given to zero trust, these are likely to happen. IAM servers, uh, services will definitely increase. We can accept, expect a huge influx of requests going through them as opposed to how current authentication requests go locally on standalone authentication servers like Active Directories. Uh, demographic bias uh, would automatically decrease once the network becomes perimeter-less or broken into small micro perimeters or segments. Now, remember when I was discussing Kazea attacks, I mentioned the MSPs, right? Therefore, we need the Z ZTX in the coming years because these MSPs are very likely to increase, which directly means that they will be more vulnerable. So, uh, being allegedly the most important species, and I say that because I believe dolphins are better, we don't hesitate to overcomplicate things. And zero trust is no stranger to that. So some of the hiccups that we observe are listed here. For example, one of the key networking changes in Heritry do not support uh, zero trust. Uh, now, if you migrate directly from on-premise to cloud infrastructure, the zero trust principles get violated. They only work if you create applications based on zero trust separately. Also, by incorporating old into new, you risk contaminating things and enlarging the scope of the problem. Now, of course, these applications can and should be replaced, but that brings new costs to the company that they were avoiding in the first place. 
also some technologies in specific vendors which are widely used are hard coded to violate, violate uh, zero trust for example peer to peer networking technology in windows is a default setting which states to share windows updates among peers to save internet bandwidth although this can be switched off many of the organizations and admins are not even aware that this exists so imagine a lateral movement from an attack vector hitting this or while it was enabled uh, might as well have happened but uh, i'm not aware of it so it's very unlikely that vendors like microsoft are going to remove these features on just an organization's request to run zero trust in their network so if you are set on doing things differently ensure you understand the technologies you're going to deploy and what controls will effectively mitigate the changes so to recap what we discussed in the session one of the best ways to implement zero trust is grill the endpoint if it puts up the fight don't take it for granted give it uh, give it least possible privilege and don't forget about it with a change in network landscape understand your network your users and your resources understand the technology build dynamic rules and implement what suits you and not what suits the attackers obviously threats will never stop coming and no company can sell you a box and say there you go you're all good you have implemented zero trust security i mean i wish it did but that is, just doesn't work like that so after i have ranted so much about what's wrong with the current practices right there's something for everyone that can help us be less attack prone security is a collaborative tool it's not a product so more people the more people are trained are scrutinized on the responses the more robust the network or the organization becomes so please take your data compliance check in seriously because every organization has a different way of dealing incidents responses so this gives you an idea about what to do if you have anything to share with that if you see any suspicious activity when you're just about to log off from your friday night shift don't wait till monday it takes just the same amount of time for attackers to take advantage of that ignorance so report any malicious activity activity when in doubt uh, as soon as possible one more thing we have forgotten uh, uh, that we use is the fact of not scanning our emails the stats still remain the same that the biggest attacks are via phishing so unnecessary email attachments and links are biggest causes for uh, attack vendors uh, i think we uh, there are organizations that use collaborative tools like sharepoints which can reduce the attack surface so something to ponder do we really need emails to contain links or attachments also take your backups don't take them uh, per month or so they should be minimum at hourly basis and if you are moving to a different team it's always a good practice to give away your previous applications and uh, privileges this this not only increases data security it can reduce data waste, wastage to a great extent and one important thing is whitelisting uh, which means sharing information within organization which is from a trusted source in my opinion blacklist does not work anymore because uh, for example you browse an ad on a secure site which has nothing harmful in it through the whole page the ad itself is also not about any malicious content and neither is the site but the problem is that the ad agency even doesn't know what kind of ads are being posted so it is very unmonitored space where you can't blame the attacker or the site so this is the whole process itself that can easily be malwertized uh, which often happens uh, and honestly no one would be thinking of blacklisting hundreds and thousands of ads right now right so go for whitelisting instead of blacklisting now i've come to the end of my presentation so i have a small quiz for you guys so if you guys can head over to the quiz um, that'll be great and uh, the links for the quiz are also on the chat so i will share the quiz in about 10 seconds so uh, if you guys want to scan it i'll give about uh, 10 seconds for you guys to scan it so i hope you guys can scan it okay i see people joining thanks kellen for joining oh perfect we have more people joining <laughs> thank you so yeah let's start so the secure the cloud services you are part of are giving you access to the applications you never use how well is the security management so yeah most of you guys uh, uh, did put up the right answer 
it's always a good practice to reach out to your security team if you are not aware what to do. So the next question. Uh, right after this session, you receive an email ad from a vendor on your personal laptop about zero trust implementation and how it can fix everything. What do you do? So I'm actually going to stop the quiz since we're running out of time. So, okay. Mark it as spam and report to email vendor. That's a good practice because nowadays AI has evolved so much that we, whatever you might be chatting on WhatsApp with your friends, that's the next ad you see on Facebook. So your data is not at all secure on uh, social media platforms. So getting a random email just after this talk is always suspicious. Uh, so actually, all of these are principles of zero trust. Uh, and always verify, never trust whoever has answered. Uh, that is one of the key points of zero trust principles. Now, imagine you get alerts to change your login password, but the reason mentioned is that you don't have authority to log into that application. What do you do? Absolutely. Uh, if anything is fishy, your password, if it doesn't make sense, always report it. So this is kind of a feedback of the session. So, and uh, thank you guys. Uh, so that was the aim of this uh, quiz. And one last thing is, remember I asked you a question about, uh, you know, paying some ransom. So. If you ever happen to be affected by ransomware, will you pay the ransom to the attackers or not? Perfect. So yes, always consult a security organization when in need. So congrats, Jonathan, uh, for winning the quiz. But I don't have a giveaway, unfortunately. So uh, this is the end of my session, guys. I hope you liked it. Uh, if you have any questions, I will take up from the chat and I'll get back to you guys. If you want to contact me, uh, my LinkedIn and my emails should be in the chat by now. Uh, and you can hit me up on LinkedIn and we can catch up if you want. And so thank you to the sponsors for making uh, the Diana Initiative happen. And uh, thanks for having me for the session.